I always had a good time seeing yeah, you. Yeah. I'll tell him. Thank you. I have a quick question. Go ahead and come and come ask you. My husband passed away at a very early age, like 42, and he had a heart attack. And um, he's a, he's the police, and he had a heart attack on duty. Okay. And I always contributed to. He was a country boy. He ate high fat, and he's a meat potato. Meat potato. But it was not the high fat. It was the stress in the carbs. It was the stress in the carbs. It wasn't the high fat. Because he could eat a pound of bacon and a dozen eggs in one sitting, but that didn't hurt him? No, I don't think so. All right. Um, I can't whistle. Thank you, Mr. Hedico. So, uh, I guess this is not working, so I'll just have to shout. Um, so, let's talk now about fasting. So. When you go on a high fat diet, I've already told you that your insulin levels go down, okay? So when your insulin levels go down, you have a steady supply of calories from fat. So this man went on a 40 day fast. For 40 days, he just drank water. So, and by the way, the world record for fasting is 383 days more than a year so this is he didn't he didn't achieve the world record so this is his blood sugar this is in european units called uh, nanomoles and that's about 90 milligrams per deciliter and within about 48 hours his blood sugars dropped to about 70 but at 70 the blood sugars are remaining stable they are not going down any further and I want to ed educate you and tell you guys why is that happening? Why he's eating nothing? And by the way, people who live in Alaska, the Maasai in Africa, there are many tribes that eat almost no carbohydrates. So there is not a single essential carbohydrate that we need to eat to live. I don't know if you knew that or no. We cannot live without fat, we cannot live without protein, but we can live without carbohydrates because why is this person's blood sugar being maintained at 70. Do you guys all know? So what's happening is that the body has this process called gluconeogenesis. What gluconeogenesis means is that it takes a certain backbone of the fatty acid molecule which is called glycerol and it takes certain amino acids from protein and it converts them to sugar. So the body is capable of making all the sugar that it needs and it really needs very trivial and small amounts of sugar when your insulin levels are low. So what's happening out here? There is something that is going up and that's called beta hydroxybutyrate and over a period of time it went up to a little over 4 millimoles and then stabilized at about 5 millimoles. What do you think that is? So that is the ketone bodies that I talked about. That is the breakdown product of fat that the body is eating. So when you stop eating, when you start fasting, what I want to tell you is that the body does not stop eating. The body eats except that instead of eating by mouth, it's eating by breaking down the fat that you have accumulated. So that is the important trick that I want you to learn because there is no diet that is good without us going back to our ancestral way of life. Our ancestral way of life included movement, exercise, getting a lot of sunshine, we didn't used to wear as many clothes, and many periods in which we didn't have food. So we fasted in our ancestral days. So I showed you this slide, these are your insulin levels when you're eating a carbohydrate standard American diet, this is a low fat diet, and it does reduce your insulin levels, but fasting is 50% more effective. Now, I'm not asking you guys to go on a 40-day fast, <laughs> okay? What I want you to tell you is that insulin levels fall by almost about 70% within the first 12 hours. So just by incorporating about three to four days of fasting, depending on how heavy you are, incorporating three to four 12-hour fast days, then you can drop your insulin levels and you can get the benefit of burning fat. Now many of my patients are coming in and telling me a trick, which I don't agree with, is saying that, hey, I eat at seven in the night and seven the next morning. 
So that's a 12-hour fast. And that doesn't count because <laughs> all of us are fasting at that time. Now there are a couple of myths about fasting. The myths about fasting is that when you start fasting, your metabolism goes down. And as your metabolism goes down, you would not lose any weight. It's all wrong. Because it makes no evolutionary sense. Our ancestors didn't have food all the time. If they didn't have food and their metabolism went down, they would die, they would perish. On the other hand, when you start fasting, the body increases the metabolism. It tells you, let me give you a little extra energy so that you can go and procure food. So this study shows that for four days of fasting, even though the weight came down by about four, about three kilograms, which is roughly around eight pounds, this is the resting energy expenditure. That means how much you are burning. And that actually went up. Oxygen consumption went up, so it didn't go down. So that tells you that when you fast, your body is not slowing down the metabolism. The metabolism is actually increasing. There is another myth, and that myth says that when you fast, you burn muscle. It doesn't happen. And there are many studies that show you that you don't burn muscle. Because in this study, they did alternate day they did fasting for alternate days. And what you noticed is that the fat mass went down from 43 kilograms to 38 kilograms. But fat-free mass remained same at 51 to 51. So in other words, fat-free mass does not change. So I want anybody who says that when you go on a fasting diet that you lose muscle mass, come and challenge me and show me the data. There is no real data. So fasting does another important thing, which is called bariatrics, medical bariatrics. Bariatrics is reducing the size of your stomach to the size of the fist by the surgeon going there with a scope and cutting it out. When you do fasting, the size of your stomach becomes smaller. And if you overeat, on a fasted state, you would get nausea, you would get belly pain, you would get palpitations. So my friends right now, my Muslim friends, are fasting from 6 o'clock in the morning till about 9 o'clock in the evening. So this is like an 18-hour fast, 16 to 18-hour fast. And in that fast, at 9 o'clock, if they eat a big meal, they'll throw up. I can guarantee you that. So what they do is, is that they take a small meal at 9 and wait for an hour or so and eat again at about an hour later, at 10 o'clock. So you may have to do that too. So when you go on a fasting diet, just make sure that you don't try to stuff yourself because if you did, you would feel uncomfortable. Okay, so um, let me talk a little bit about vitamin D because this is uh, another area that is one of my favorites now. And I order vitamin D levels on all of you who come. By the way, this is, I'm not giving you individual medical advice. I'm not giving personal medical advice. I'm giving you information so that you go and discuss with your physician. If that's me, I would be honored. If that's somebody else, you should do that. So don't try doing it on your own. Get some medical help. So vitamin D, many people will be surprised to know, comes from cholesterol. The cholesterol in our skin is acted on by UV radiation and it gets changed to vitamin D or specifically vitamin D3. So there is a vitamin D deficiency in this country and I wonder to what degree it depends on the fact that we are trying to drive everybody's cholesterol down. And people who came here last time, I had given a presentation very similar to this but focused almost exclusively on how trying to reduce cholesterol with cholesterol-lowering medicines is bad for you, okay? So I won't be able to get into that, but it's, it's a nice YouTube uh, that, uh, that we had done for the doctors. You can go and watch that. I'm sorry? So uh, it's called Lipid Seminar at Clear Lake. Just put, go to YouTube and put Lipid Seminar at Clear Lake. You will get it. So this sun, sun is acting on, on cholesterol, converts it to vitamin D3. And right now, we don't get enough sun. Because first of all, we live in a temperate zone. Temperate zone, the sun comes at an angle. 
we have a very short window of time to get UVB which is the ultraviolet B radiation. So we get some vitamin D from food sources because it is fortified, but really a person who is eating a good diet that I recommend which is saturated fat, butter, meat gets about 2000 units of vitamin D3, but I think that we really need somewhere in the range of 4 to 5000. So why is vitamin D important? The reason vitamin D is important and I want to spend a minute about that is because it takes the blueprint that the cell has. Our cell has a blueprint which is called DNA and whenever our cell gets attacked by an injury, by an infection, by inflammation, the cell has to look at the blueprint to appropriate, to mount an appropriate response. And what vitamin D does is that it interprets the blueprint so that the cell can respond properly. I was shocked to see that vitamin D deficiency is associated with high blood pressure unequivocally, is associated with type 2 diabetes, is associated with a very high risk of prostate cancer in men and associated with high risk of breast cancer in women. Okay, so vitamin D is needed to read the DNA blueprint to protect the cell from inflammation and injury. So this is a busy slide, but this is at 32 nano mo nanograms per ml. So this is this is this line is 32. So this is considered to be the least amount of vitamin D levels in blood that is effective. 70% of US population is below 32 nanograms per deciliter. So that is like a huge population that is exposed to injury because vitamin D levels are low. This is a very popular slide that is used. This is the Maasai. These people are the last of the people who have not adopted to the modern civilization. They are hunter gatherers, they don't eat any carbohydrates, they have very little clothing, they spend a large amount of time in equatorial sun, which means at the equator where you get a lot of UVB. So if you look at their vitamin D levels, their vitamin D levels are somewhere in the range of about 120 to 140 millimoles per liter. That translates to about 80 nanomoles, nanograms per deciliter. So in our units that would be 80. So this is where the hunter gatherers are or where these are humans that are exposed to radiation such as lifeguards. This is more or less us. This is blood levels then we take about a thousand units and this is blood levels when we take upwards of 4000 units of vitamin D3. So I'm not big on supplements, I don't ask anybody to take supplements. But where we live, we don't get consistent sun. So the, they are making, I'm making two exceptions. I'm not selling the supplements. You got to go and buy them on your own. But almost all of us should take vitamin D supplements. And perhaps almost all of us should take omega-3 from krill oil. So um, what I want to do is to summarize now. And what we have done is to show you that a low-carb, high-fat diet increases your good cholesterol, it reduces your triglycerides, it improves the quality of your LDL cholesterol which is called the bad cholesterol and the reason I think it's called the bad cholesterol because the drug industry makes roughly 30 billion dollars selling drugs to reduce it and I think that is extremely detrimental to the health of majority of people. When you go on a low carb, high fat diet, your insulin levels also fall, your blood sugars fall, your inflammation marker falls, and of course your weight also drops. But that is not as important as all the other things that I talked about. What does a low carb, high fat diet consist of? It consists of fatty meat, fatty fish, lard, ghee, butter, olive oil, fatty cheese, sour cream, coconut oil, and it also consists of fasting. If you're not going to incorporate fasting into your low-carb, low high-fat diet, you're not going to get benefit. So for the first time, I'm making an exception. I have never really prescribed any supplements. For the first time, I'm saying take vitamin D3 and take krill oil. Because krill oil contains uh, EPA and DHA, which are specific types of omega-3 
uh, fatty acids that are not found in vegetarian diet. They are not found in vegetarian diet. Vegetarian diet may say omega-3, but it is precursor of omega-3 and our body does not convert the precursor to the DHA and EPA as effectively. The low carb high fat diet also means that you stop eating grains, that you stop eating cereal and oatmeal. Many people say I eat oatmeal, it's healthy, so I, I say that you need to stop that. Of course, sugar, sweets, cookies, sweeteners should go. And this is a big surprise for people. Why do I say stop eating vegetable oils? Tell me, like anybody. No, let's say they're not hydrogenated. Let's say this corn oil, it's polyunsaturated, but it's not hydrogenated. So sunflower oil, safflower oil. Why am I saying don't have vegetable oils? Um, somebody said something about omega? Omega-6, okay, yes. Vegetable oils are high in omega-6. Our body needs omega-3, and over time, with a modern diet, the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 that we are eating is going down. So you need to stop using this, and in its place, use lard for cooking. Use butter for cooking. Use ghee for cooking. Can you use olive oil to cook? Why can you not use olive oil to cook? It's got a low smoking point. You can use olive oil. Yes, thank you. Olive oil has a low smoking point. Using olive oil for cooking gets it oxidized. You can use it in salads without heating, but you cannot use it in cooking. You can use coconut oil because it takes heat well, but coconut oil has its own smell. So what do I eat? So as a low carber, is it sustainable? Several of my patients are, are on it. They have sustained it for two and a half years. My whole group does it. Shalini does it. I do it two and a half years. It's excellent. I have not had any food today and I'm running on fat. And I don't think you think I'm really particularly slow or my brain is not functioning well, right? So no sugar, no grains, no starch, no fruit. So what would your food look like? Your food would look like butter. I would rather that you have grass-fed butter because it would have some omega-3 and carotenoids. But do, if it's expensive, go for this. It's still better metabolically than using vegetable oils. I want you to use, uh, get organic eggs because they are yellower. They'll have omega-3 in them, especially if the chicken are fed flaxseed. I want you to go for lamb, for fatty cheese, Pistachios, that are a good source of fiber and fat. The carbohydrate in them is complex carbohydrate that the body does not absorb easily. <coughs> Almonds, the same thing. Pecans, uh, we are an area that pecans are grown a lot. If you have a body mass index that is greater than 30, if you have a body mass index that is greater than 30, and this is very harsh, I'm telling you this is very harsh, I don't want you to eat fruits. What do fruits have? Sure. They have fructose. So fructose goes, at least when you eat bread or rice, it has glucose. Glucose can be used by the muscles, it can be used by the brain. The fructose has only one metabolic target, it gets into the liver because it doesn't need insulin. And when you feed a large amount of fructose through soda pop and other drinks, what happens to your liver? Fatty. Fatty liver, yes. So if you are already heavy and you are insulin resistant, you cannot afford to take fruits that are high in fructose. So the fruits that are low in fructose are berries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. Uh, this is a particularly good thing, flaxseed, especially if you are a vegetarian. So um, with that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to tell you that this has been a really good journey for us because for the first time being a physician for 25 years, I used to hate going to clinic. I do good angioplasty and stents and I used to love being in the hospital, taking care of patients, having heart attacks. I would hate going to the office because I'd say I do nothing out there that's of any benefit to my patients. I just give them medicines that don't work and I just don't want to be there. 
but in the last two and a half years it has transformed me. The reason it has transformed me is because I see the benefit that my patients are having and it's not because of any medicines I prescribe. It's only because I now understand the biochemistry much better. Medical school curriculum, I never learned this in medical school. Medical school curriculum has less than four hours on nutrition. And physicians are supposed to be the experts at giving nutritional advice. And we have no idea. And we have absolutely no idea. So with that, I'll stop. If you have questions, I'll answer them. And I'll wait here as long as you want. Please go ahead. So good, a good question that you asked, vitamin D requires an hour of lecture on its own. When you get sunshine, there was a study done in Sweden on 80,000 women. The, they were divided into quartiles. The highest sunshine group, the one that got the highest sunshine, then the, low, the next one, and the next one, and the lowest one. In which group do you think had a higher incidence of cancer? So the highest one, had the lowest incidence of cancer. Because when sun hits your skin, UVB is making vitamin D and melanin. Melanin is the pigment protein that protects your nucleus from getting damage from the skin. The UVA causes the burning reaction and tells you to get out. So studies after studies are now showing that people exposed to more sunshine have a lower risk of malignant melanoma, which is the tumor that kills you but they have a slightly higher risk of squamous and basal cell cancers. So what we want to tell people is get out of the sun. What do you think sunscreen does to you? Protects you or doesn't protect you? Okay, so you have UVB that is beneficial and UVA that is not so beneficial. What does sunscreen do to UVB? It completely blocks it. What does it do to UVA? It blocks it, but not as good. So you are removing the beneficial rays, and you are letting the rays that are harmful get in. Studies after studies now show, and this is not common knowledge, studies after studies now show that people who use sunscreen have a higher incidence of malignant melanoma. Vitamin D in and of itself deserves an entire R to every person in the United States. You know, what I gave you was just like a snippet. And I'm grateful that you asked me that question. I have a second question. How is this diet that you suggest is different than Atkins diet? So I want to thank Dr. Robert Atkins for doing this. He started it in the 70s. He was a pioneer. He didn't have all the research data that we now have available. But our diet is fundamentally different. The reason it's different is because it's not a high protein diet. It's a high fat diet. There is focus on fat. And if you're doing this diet and you're not fasting, you will not get all the, you'll still get benefit, but you'll not get all the benefit. You know the question way at the back. Okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So I needed about 15, 20 minutes to speak about statins. And can you, can you go to my talk, Lipid Seminar at Clear Lake and read it? But I try to talk my patients out of statins. I give them all the information that, the, that is there. I'll just talk about one study if you would like. There is a, a recent trial called the Fourier trial that had 28,000 patients enrolled in it. So 28,000 patients enrolled in the Fourier trial. 14,000 were given the PCSK9 inhibitor, which is an injectable inhibitor. The other groups were just given a statin. What do you think was the LDL cholesterol? LDL cholesterol, they say, for somebody who doesn't have heart disease, keep it less than 100. Majority of these patients had already had previous heart attacks. Okay, What do you think that the LDL cholesterol went down to? In the people who took that new drug that is injected into their, uh, into their subcutaneous tissue, it went down to 30 milligrams per deciliter, 30, 3, 0. So, here are 14,000 patients taking this drug. It went down to 30 milligrams per deciliter. 
444 patients died in that group at two and a half years. There are 14,000 patients who are not taking that drug. So 444 deaths here, how many deaths do you think here? 424, so less people died in the group that were not taking that drug. Now, there was a slightly higher risk of having a heart attack in group that did not take the drug. But when you do these studies in 140 centers all across the world and the drug companies gathering all the data, I don't trust that data. And the next thing is that even if you do trust that data, what we found is that if you treated 100 patients at the cost of $2.4 million for two years, you will reduce one heart attack. Okay? So now when this study was shown at the American Heart Association, they said this is a seismic improvement in risk factors. And it is not. It's that we are so biased. Physicians are employed by the drug industry. That we are so biased in giving you the data. The American Heart Association receives millions of dollars from all these drug companies. The drug companies are making us focus on LDL cholesterol, whereas the real reason why we are having this problem is insulin resistance, not cholesterol. So that's my short version about it, but you should discuss this with your doctor. Yes, sir, please. Uh, you didn't talk about alcohol. So yeah, usually comes up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> alcohol is like fructose. Alcohol is a sugar. And in small amounts, I would say, okay, especially if you're thin, but it goes to the liver and it gets converted to fat if you cannot dispose it off. So in other words, if you have already too much nutrients in your system, if, you're sh if your cells are filled with sugar, then when you drink alcohol, it gets converted to fat. I don't recommend alcohol because alcohol also causes high blood pressure and atrial fibrillation. So it's not one of my favorites, but if people want to drink one glass of wine for men and less than one glass for women, I'm not going to object to it. Beth, you had a question? I'll get to you in a second. Go ahead, Beth. It's about the fasting. Um, why does fasting only work during the hours? Well, it can work at night time too, but most of us are fasting at night. And I have not noticed any benefit in patients who come and say they are fasting at night. <laughs> so if you... You, you, got to, you got to skip a meal. So let's say you have dinner, I mean you have lunch, you don't have dinner and you eat the next morning, that's beneficial. But if you're having dinner and breakfast and having two meals during the day, I would say that's not helping. Katie, go ahead, I'm sorry. You know, we're so used to counting calories. Do we need to watch the calorie count on a daily basis? So no. The reason you don't need to count calories on this diet is because your sugar levels remain steady. And when your sugar levels remain steady and your insulin goes down, your satiety signals start working and you'll automatically stop eating. So I, ha I have had nobody who needs to count calories. You don't need to buy those apps and put all that effort into putting this portion size, that portion size, none of that. I have had so many patients improve without counting any calories, including myself. I lost 20 pounds on this diet and it has made me a better cyclist. I don't have any, I don't know if my cycling friends are here, <laughs> but um, yes, go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, I have many questions. Um, okay, so how do you get your fiber from this diet and can you also talk about chia seeds and flax seeds? Excellent, so there are lots of, uh, lots of sources of fiber in this. I didn't put up in there that you need, you can consider having green leafy vegetables, you can have avocados. Almonds are an excellent source of fiber. Flax seed is an excellent source of fiber. Chia seeds are good sources of fiber. The chia seeds and flax seeds are decent sources of omega-3 for vegetarians. But vegetarians are basically SOL on this diet. What is SOL? <laughs> so, That's one second, I just want to clarify a little bit. So the reason for that is that if you are a vegan, 
and you don't eat any cheese and you don't eat any eggs, you really are in trouble. You can still get better, but if you are a vegan, I advise you to eat raw. Because when you eat raw, your sugar levels don't go up, you're having a lot of fiber. But if I were to try to eat raw, if I were to try to eat raw, I'd have to eat three hours a day to get the amount of calories that I need. And I don't have three hours. Yes, sir, go ahead. Peanuts. Tell us about peanuts. So I put peanut oil out there, and it's a no-no. Peanuts is not a nut, it's a legume. It has omega-6 in it, not omega-3. So I advise no peanuts, and I advise almonds in its place, because almonds have the same nutritional value, but they have omega-3. So you get above the ground nuts and not peanuts. What about walnuts? Are they, good? they are excellent. Walnuts is an excellent source. Go ahead. supposed to fast every day or is fasting just skipping one meal or and you do it every day so it's a good question so I'll tell you uh, I have normal body mass index but I still think that I need to fast so I routinely go through and my office will tell you I routinely go through two to three days of having 12 hours between meals during the daytime if you have a body mass index greater than 30, you are likely to be insulin resistant. And if you are insulin resistant, then I would definitely recommend that you fast at least three to five times per week if you can. And that will bring about a lot more benefit than you would. Now, the heavier you are, the more insulin resistant you are, we should do more fasting. 12 hours is enough because it drops your insulin levels by about 70%. And over time, you will get benefit. No, you can, if you eat at 11, you can eat at 5 and then go from 5 until the next morning and that will give you excellent benefit because you're having two 12-hour fasts more or less. Sorry, sir, you had, I'll get to you in a second. Yes, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. So very good question. I didn't spend time on exercise. Uh, I think exercise is fundamental. I exercise a lot. But I can tell you, uh, there are people in this community who have exercised their entire lives. They have run marathons, half marathons, ultra marathons, long cycling brevets, and they have still become diabetics. They have still become obese. So exercise without doing a high fat, low carb diet and without fasting does not work. Does not work. Lester, go ahead. Uh, how does, uh Diet affect, like, your gout problems? So, um, gout happens because of insulin resistance. Excellent question. Gout comes from insulin resistance. High insulin levels promote gout. This, this diet is excellent for gout. Okay? This diet is also excellent for people with gallstones. And if somebody asks me that, I'll tell them why it is. Yes, go ahead. Drop, I'm shaky, I'm miserable, I feel sick. How do you prevent that in the beginning stage of the diet? So I would say that's not a, you know, it's not something that I have really observed. But if that's happening to you, I would consider eating high quality carbohydrates to prevent that from happening. High quality carbohydrates.
said, here's the things you should eat and shouldn't eat. So, uh, there are several sources on the internet. You put low carb, high fat recipes. You book Tim Noakes, N O A K E S. There is a new Atkins diet book that. You I, none of these are substitutes. None of these are substitutes. You, nutrition is a drug and it is the single biggest factor that is affecting your health. So you need to get personally involved and start doing the shopping, look at your grocery list. I have a grocery list out there. It changes with seasons. So you need to take charge. You can look at as many recipes as you want, but unless you take charge and learn what is high fat and what is good fat, you're not going to follow that diet. Go ahead, I think you had a question, Chris. Go ahead, sir. I'll get to you in a second. Go ahead. So, what about whey so excellent question. So, um, the question was, what about whey protein? So, many people, of, m many of us use uh, protein powders and stuff like that, purified protein powders. I don't like people to have a high protein diet for a couple of reasons. One is that high protein increases your insulin levels. And highly refined protein behaves like sugar in the body. High insulin levels are associated with an increased risk of cancers and other problems. In addition, high protein diet also releases a protein called mTOR. mTOR increases the cell division. It makes the cells divide. And that's another reason why we get cancers. So I don't recommend a high protein diet. This is a high fat diet. You had a question. Go ahead. So, uh, good question. As long as they are not roasted in peanut and other vegetable oils, I would say that's okay. Because raw nuts are not very tasty and I have not gotten used to them. So, I get nuts that have sea salt in them, but I don't get them if they have been roasted in any of the vegetable oils that I talked about. So, uh, maybe we take two, three more questions and then I will stay here. And then you guys can come and ask me individual questions because I don't want the entire group to wait. I would feel bad that I'm keeping you guys here. Yes, go ahead, sir, and then I'll get to you second. So what's the effect of uh, long-term ketosis on dementia and Alzheimer's? So um, oh, it's a good question. So let's say you, know, you, you go out of here and you say, Dr. Ali makes sense and I'm going to go on a high-fat, low-carb diet. And you're going to ask me, what is the outcomes data? So, you know, that's a broader question. What's the outcomes data? Outcomes data is that when you follow this diet, is there a reduction in heart attack? Is there an increase in longevity? Is there a reduction in strokes? Is there a reduction in dementia? So, that answer is not there because I don't see anybody, any drug company jumping up and trying to say, hey, I'm going to do a 20,000 patient study with five-year follow-up. There is no information like that. But there is plenty of information. There is plenty of information on surrogate endpoints. Surrogate endpoints are what happens to your insulin levels? They drop. What happens to your triglyceride levels? They drop. What happens, we think, to dementia? I think dementia gets better. The brain functions better on ketones. The cleanest burning fuel that our body can use is fat because fat does not produce oxygen radicals. When you burn fat, you don't produce oxygen radicals. When you burn carbohydrate, it increases inflammation. <laughs> so that's a round of way, roundabout way of answering your question. But I am optimistic that it reduces dementia. Yeah, go ahead. I'll come to you in a second. Is there, so you said uh, you, you don't like a high protein diet. What is considered a normal protein diet versus high protein? What, what numbers are we talking about? And then so if you are, uh, if you want to kind of get that much into detail, first of all, I don't get that much into detail in my own diet and I don't recommend that. But let's say you want to know exactly in grams per kilogram body weight how much you should get, I would say about 1 to 1.5 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. So if you're 60 kilograms, I would say between 60 and 100 uh, grams of protein per day. 
But I don't think I like to do that. What I do is that I go to a restaurant, I order a small piece of steak, I ask the, but, uh, the waiter to get me two small cubes of butter, I put butter on my steak and I eat more butter. I do the same way I cook at home, I put ghee or butter so that I'm not having lean food. I don't go to the grocery store and buy lean meat, I buy fatty meat. If I could eat pork and bacon, I would love to do that. Okay, so if you, you guys have the opportunity, do it. You had one, we'll take one last question, maybe two here and then we will, I'll stay here. Go ahead. Boy, you guys are so smart. So the question is, medium chain triglyceride oil versus coconut oil. So coconut oil is medium chain triglyceride oils. But some people further refine the medium chain, uh, further refine coconut oil to medium chain triglycerides they take C8 and C10. So coconut oil has C6, C8, C10, and C12 in terms of the length of the carbon, in, in terms of how long the fatty acid is. The C6 causes the coconut oil to have smell. The C12 is not as beneficial. So there is a gentleman who makes brain octane. It's MCT oil. He sells the, the coffee, the bulletproof coffee. It's very expensive, by the way. Brain Octane is about 25 bucks for a bottle. You go to HEB, you get $8 for the same thing. But So I would get Luan's MCT oil. It, they both work the same. I have never been successful in, e in eating or, or drinking or cooking with coconut oil. I just don't like the smell or the taste. But if you like it, it's really good for you. You had a question? Rays and the sunscreen block it. So is clothes going to block it, or does it, in order to get the good rays, is so, it direct skin contact with the sun rays? That's such an excellent question. If you're getting sun indoors through windows, well, it, it blocks it blocks UVB. If you have paper on your skin, it blocks UVB. You need to have exposed skin, and vitamin D is so important. And and I don't know why I never focused on it because I said. This is what an endocrinologist should do. This is what the primary physician should do. It's not my job to look into vitamin D. But now studies show that if you go out in the sun and you spend two hours and you come in and you immediately take a shower, you lose all the benefit. Uh -huh. Because vitamin D is oil that is forming on your skin and our, and our ancestors didn't take shower right away. So I'm not saying that you should do that. <laughs> so. Also, temperate climates like where we live, we don't have sun at an angle to get vitamin D regularly and routinely. So half an hour of midday sun exposure gives us about 10 to 15,000 units of vitamin D that we make on our skin, provided we do all the right things to keep it. So that's a long answer. You know, like this area is so interesting that I think we should all spend an hour learning about it. Are you going to test this for vitamin D? Everyone who comes in, you ask my, like, there's no one who doesn't get vitamin D tested. Okay, because I have Can we st stop at that last question and then I'll stay here. I have heard about that blood type diet and I think that gentleman is very good, the, the, the person who is on that uh, website. And he is promoting more or less a similar kind of philosophy. Now, uh, there are rumblings. What I want to tell you is that there are probably about less than one in a thousand physicians who is kind of working, on, working towards this. So, so somebody like me is still in the way in the minority. I think it's going to take about 10 to 20 years for this to become mainstream. So you guys are the, uh, are the people who are going to promote it. You guys are the ones who need to spread the message, give this information out, look at different websites. So that's a good question. I've been dying to share this with you and the audience. Please. I got Medicare to pay the $5,000 for the upright UVB machine. Oh, wow. Oh. OK, good. So five, 10 minutes a day in front of that, that's it. Just don't wash your skin right after that. <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> what you need, what you need